don't want to go into all these theories. Huh? Einstein's theory of uh, sp special relativity first in 1905, and then Einstein, right? Do you know that, that uh, special relativity means that velocity was constant in the universe? And Einstein thought that velocity was constant, speed is constant, everything goes, everything is linear like this, including time. Time is also linear. When it starts from the beginning, it goes like this. It turns out. Huh? It took him 10 years, Einstein himself then, he came after 10 years of study, he went and said, no, I have now a new theory, it's theory of general relativity. Wait, special relativity is not really it. I have to accommodate for slow motion, fast motion, etc., all these things in the universe. And with all these things, obviously, you know, many things came after the law of general relativity, meaning that also time is different. And we've talked about that the other day, yeah? yeah? And if you were to take a trip, we said to Andromeda, this very, very next galaxy to us. Now we are in the Milky Way. You want to take a trip to our next door neighbor, takes you, we said, engineering wise, it's not possible. Like in physics wise, it's possible. The laws are there. Make the ship, you go, Bismillah. You go in 50 years, you come back, and Earth is already now four, four some million years old. Therefore, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, it's not possible of this and Maraj is absolutely not possible. Forget about it. What are you talking about? Oh, very good. And that's what we have. You know, I'm saying these things for the notions we have every now and then. You get somebody who comes, learns a couple of things, and he says these things. Surely, I will say that I don't have a physics proof to do. It's a matter of belief for me. Like, and according to Einstein, obviously, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if even if he was to travel the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, it takes you what? How many million years? 400 million light years, the end of the edge of the universe. If there is an edge, that's if we talk about a closed universe versus an open universe. And this is a, a discussion amongst scholars, huh? Yeah, yeah, amongst philosophers. Well, Ajib, you know, I saw that Ibn Rushd, and while he's such a great thinker, big mind, Ibn Rushd, huh? Ibn Rushd is a big, big mind, like, and he goes into taqlid of Aristotle to say that the universe is closed. We see Al-Ghazali goes and he, he sort of negates it in an indirect way. That well, why would you say it's closed? Oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa samaa banaynaha bi-aydin wa inna la musi'oon. We've built heavens and we are musi'oon. There is wusa in it and we're expanding it the meaning of it. Now it could be other meanings like and this seems to be the general meaning. Anyway, according to Einstein's theory, obviously, even if you travel the speed of light and there's nothing faster than the speed of light, allegedly until now, by the time you get to the end of the universe, the universe has already doubled in, in size. So you're not going to get to the end of it. And even if you get then, let's say you do get, which is not possible, by the time you come back to Earth, even if it's few hours in space, Earth is already a couple of million years old, few, more than hundred of million years old. So you've, how can he go and come back then in the same night and the time is still frozen in a sense or the time is not, has not passed? So this becomes an argument issue and all these things. Like the Quran assures us of a, I don't want to classify the Isra and Mi'raj as Mu'jiza, really it's Makruma versus Mu'jiza. Mu'jiza is when you challenge people in front of you. How can nobody went with the Prophet ﷺ to heavens and came back? So it was an honor and that's why Allah Ta'ala says, لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا Takreem. It was an honoring of Rasulullah ﷺ to show him some of the ayahs that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala created in this universe. And you all know obviously the physicists talk today about that this universe goes so much, so galaxies, right? In every galaxy, there's like our galaxy, maybe about a hundred, hundred million stars in it, not much. Huh? And then there's 400 billion galaxies they talk about. So far, they think, so if you want to go till the end, according to Einstein, there will be that, you'll meet the black hole. Salaamu Alaikum, black hole. Black hole, what is that black hole? They say massive energy, gravity. Anything that goes into it, it swallows. Monster. Huh? It swallows everything that goes into it. 
uh, Ajeeb, one of the scholars, his name is Roy Kerr, K-E-R-R. He says there's a way, he says, because even that black hole, light itself cannot escape it. That's why they call it black hole, because even if light goes, it sucks light in, and it moves at a speed as well. But Kerr went to say, if you were to escape the edges of the black hole, which, which he calls, or which is called in physics, event horizon, huh? that's where you get sucked in. If you were to escape it and go straight in the middle, you actually may go to another parallel universe. So it becomes like a bridge between this universe that you have and you go to another and that's where physicists now start calling it this is the beginning is white hole and then the on the other side i'm sorry black hole on the other side is white hole both of them one ways you can't go in and out of the other and that seems to be a replica or another dimension entirely different than the first oh they're talking about now even in that bridge in fact nathan rosen with Einstein, they went and named that bridge between one universe and the other, the, the Einstein-Rosen bridge. You go into that bridge, the, that channel, and that's where obviously to physicists, time collapses. There is no time. Time stops. Collapsed. Done. As a dimension, it's done. It's closed. You go into the other dimension now. What is the other dimension? No, it's still theory, nobody knows. Is there after that dimension, another dimension? And after that a dimension, then how can you go and come back all at the same time, all these things? So people talk and all these scientists, obviously, as you all know, we're all growing and we're all knowing these things. We hear in the hadith of the Isra and Mi'raj that the Prophet وسلم, when he went to one heaven, at the one heaven, there was uh, Jibreel alayhi salam with him and he was, you know, they were seeking permission to go through the second dimension. Where is that second dimension? Where is that first heaven? How did the Prophet ﷺ go to all these heavens and saw then all these things were a time where he was seeing things in the future? Yeah, and he meaning saw people in Jannah who are not yet in Jannah, who have not even been born yet. Yeah, they have not even been, been born, but he saw them وسلم, in Jannah. Or saw people in Jahannam and they haven't yet been born. How does that happen except with their, when the time is collapsed now? So that the past is present, the presence is present, and the future is also present. Because then once the time is collapsed, all things are there for you to see. Unlike what people said, some Sufis want to say, no, he saw it in Alam al Mithal in sort of an image form or foretelling. Why can it be really the real rather than a mithal, for example? And that the time has collapsed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he saw these things anyway. Uh, we don't want to go too much in that. There's a, a Kaluza and Klein in 1970, both physicists as well. They figured, wait, I mean, number one, these, blacks, the bla these black holes are not three dimensions. That's why you can't really see them and they have no size. They have a huge mass, but no size. Now figure this out. Not only that, you can't really see them because they're not three dimensions. That's what you use to perceive. They're four dimensions. And then Klein and, other, and these other people, they said, wait, there's not just four dimensions, there's 11 dimensions. Well, 11 dimensions? Which dimension now? 11 on all these things. Among the things they came, Galuza and Klein, they said there is something called super strings. Super strings or super gravity. It's sort of a dimension within all these dimensions, like a super channel. You get into it and it takes you from one dimension to the other without having to go the physical distance. You know how they used to go in the old days. From, for example, uh, North Africa to Hajj. Huh? On the camel, it takes them, or from India to Hajj. If they take the camel, it's going to take them months of travel. Huh? And if they don't take the camel, if they have to go through the ship and all these things, it's still months anyway, until they go, and then it takes them months to come back. Now you go in a couple of hours. <laughs> Business class, Bismillah. No problem. Huh? It seems like, I'm not saying this is necessarily a dimension, but it's a mechanic or some mechanism that people have figured out that they've realized or discovered the laws of physics that Allah Ta'ala already created and use them so they can speed 
that travel that takes a long time. Basically, what Klein and Kaluza are saying, they are these super strings and they call them strings. So as if the universe is actually the, the skies are actually like a circle, strings, a circle. Wajib when you look at when Allah Ta'ala said, وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْحُبُكْ Hubuk means actually circles over circles. <coughs> and maybe in the old days, because they always thought that circle is more complex than any linear sort of thing. In the sense, that's why you see even they said in the old mythology, they said shayateen and jinn, they don't move straight. They go in circles. Now, I don't know if they mean that metaphorically or they mean it real. In other words, you know, if someone who is not honest, he will always go in what? He will go in circles. He's not going to go straight and tell you, why is he going in circles? They say, this is what shayateen do. Huh? How do you know shayateen go in circles? They say, wait, the, have you seen this, this uh, horseshoe people put on their door? Huh? You see this horseshoe, they take a horseshoe, he slaps it on the door. Oh. And I, when I was a kid, I used to think that this is, means a force. If you come to us, we'll kick you with a horse, with like a foot of a horse. Oh, and that's not how it is really. They figured because shayateen, they move into circles. If they come to their house, they're going to go into that circle, but that circle is not complete. So he's going to drop, shaytan will drop in front of their door and he will leave. Well, until today, people put this horseshoe. We'll go give it to a horse, ya habibi, inta better. Wustaith billah min ash-shaytan rajim Like, and they still put that, that why? It's that circle is not complete. The shaytan, if he comes to my house to hurt me, he will go into that half circle, then he drops right in front of my door. Uh, out. Huh? Sometimes you wonder how people think these things. Until today, a thousand, two thousand years ago, we understand today, Oh, they say shaitan goes in circles. Khair, inshallah, ma'ahu. Some people go in circles as well. Naam, Allah Ta'ala, that's why Allah Ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa ar-Rahim wa kathalika ja'alna li kulli nabiyin aduwan shayateen al-insi wal-jinn. Qaddam al-ins, shayateen al-ins, ala shayateen al-jinn. He put the shayateen of human beings before the shayateen of jinn. It seems that the shayateen of human beings are worse than the shayateen of jinn. Oh, I said once, they asked Al-Hasan Al-Bisri, allegedly, and I don't have an authentic sign to this, so leave it, take it, leave it, whatever you like to do, do. And I can allegedly tabi'i Al-Jaleel, Hassan Al-Basri, or Al-Bisri, whatever you like. They asked him, they said, uh, he said, he, he told them a dream. The dream was, uh, he says, I saw Shaitan in my dream. I told Shaitan, stop misguiding people. Why are you keep misguiding? Take a break, Akhi. In that sense, allegedly, Hassan uh, Shaitan told uh, Hassan al Basri, he told them, Look, Ya Aba Sa'id, O oh Abu Sa'id, in the old days we used to teach them how to be misguided. Now we learn from them. <laughs> Take lessons. The, I don't want to use the miraculous nature, but I don't have any other thing to say, maybe. But the miraculous nature of the Isra and Mi'raj, obviously, to us. That the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa azwaji wa ashabu sallam wholesome went in Isra and Mi'raj. That's because of the capacity. We've talked about it last week. That Allah ta'ala capacitated the Anbiya with. Well, if it was a dream, yani with all the respect, yeah, yeah. everybody, how many people, many of you saw themselves in a dream in Jannah already. Khalas, alhamdulillah, you're done. Huh? You come, oh, a couple of weeks ago, I had somebody from Medina said, I saw myself in Jannah, literally in Jannah, and I saw you there. I said, Alhamdulillah, may Allah make us all in Jannah as well. <laughs> so that means there's no need for Isra and Mi'raj, then that's the case. Everybody sees themselves in Jannah. What's specific to the prophecy? This, there's a spe specific thing. It's not just a mere dream. And that's the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the Anbiya with. Because they have to deal with light, meaning the, 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 the angels. They have, to deal with, they have to deal with jinn, meaning from nar. They have to deal with, diff to deal with different elements. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, enabled them that way. And that's why when Allah ta'ala, if you look at it, Huh? When Allah Ta'ala said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا اتَّسَقْ لَتَرْكَبُنَّ طَبَقًا 
هاند ذيس از روايه حفصه لتركبون يو شال رايد اور بي اليفيتد فروم ون طبق ون لاير طبق مينز ا لاير اوفر انذر طبق انذر لاير انذر يونيفرس انذر ديمنشن لكن ريلي قراءه ابن مسعود وعامه قراء الكوفه موست اوف ذا قراء اوف كوفه ذي سي لتركبن طبقا عن عن طبق يو يا رسول الله نت لتركبن انتم يو نوت جوينج انتو معراج سوري ها لكن ذا بروفيت صلى الله لتركبن فيرسز لتركبن يعني انت يا محمد لتركبن طبقا يو ويل جو ون لاير اوفر لاير اند ذاتس ذا هول بوينت اوف اسراء المعراج اند ذاتس واي الله تبارك وتعالى سيد والسماء ذات الحبوب سو هاو دو وي نو ذات ذس ام ثيوري ها ذا ام ثيوري ذات كلاين اند كالوزا كيم ويز ان ذا 70s يعني ذير از نو ذات شانل يو كم ان اند It reduces the travel needed in these dimensions, where time is collapsed, all these things, etc. Lakin, maybe you can argue about this physics and all these things. Allah Ta'ala starts the ayah with Subhan Alladhi Asra. Glorify him above non-befitting attributes, non-suitable attributes. يعني تنزه عن النقصان أو النقص. What does that mean? تنزه عن النقص. Don't think that Allah is not capable. Maybe there is a reason Allah started it with Subhan. Don't think while you don't think that's possible in your laws that you have now. But Subhan, that's why before you even go there, Subhan Alladhi Asra, don't ever attribute to Allah incapability of doing so based on the laws you've just uncovered. Tomorrow you may uncover different laws. It may become possible. Now it is not possible. It may become possible then. But regardless what it is, Subhan Alladhi Asra, glorified he is the one who sent his messenger, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, through all these things. Meaning what? Challenging everything you know and you have so far. And even if, even not, you will still tan, tal, will be challenged. And that's why Allah Ta'ala said, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins, fi surat al-Rahman, in istata'atum an tanfudhu min, Ya, shuf, look at that, aqtar, ajeeb. In love of today, um, uh, aqtar, aqtar is a plural of qutr. Qutr means radius of a circle. Aqtar means radii of circles. Why does Allah say Aqtar as Samawat? Ajib. It means as if then Samawat have radii, not just one radius, not just one Sama, one heaven, but multi, lots of, you have circles, and that's why they have Aqtar, they have radii, not just a radius. Fanfudu. Allah says Fanfudu. If you can go through the radii of heavens, the dimensions of heavens to the other al quran kareem says go لا تنفذون إلا بسلطان you shall never go through except sultan what is that sultan maybe that sultan is rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself well he's the first one who went huh he's the first one who went as if he's not your imam but he's imam as well he's ahead of you not only in the akhirah he's ahead of you also in the dunya so he made the way for you to go so you can follow and that's why you should learn from the isra and miraj a point that's very important ya akhi the sky is not the limit the sky is just the beginning the sky is just the beginning That's where Iqbal mentioned something like that. Huh? Iqbal, the Shah of Pakistan, has this, took this understanding from the Isra and Miraj. Where he uh, mentioned in one of his poetries, he said, What I learned from the Isra and Miraj is that the end of the universe is possible for human beings. It's there. It's there for you. Ke alam e bashariyat ki zad mehe kar do. No, alam bashariyat. You can actually go all the way to the end of the universe. That's what I learned from the. That's what the Qur'an says. I'm learning from the Isra and Miraj that we don't stand still and don't do anything. Like today, we are basically. waiting on the accomplishments of many others so we can have an improve a better life.
versus what Iqbal is looking at, what is the Ummah is doing with I learned from the Isra and Mi'raj that actually that for the Alam of the Bashar, for the human beings, that we can also go all the way to the end of the universe. What are you waiting here doing? For the people who ritualize this deen and reduce it to a set of list of do's and list of don'ts, طبعاً, don't dare you speak with knowledge. Well, otherwise, they will call you kafir or mushrik or mubtadi' or jahil. Well, you get these ansaf, half knowledgeable. Who has heard one word of, of YouTube? Or the other has heard one word of, of Mawlana Google, radiyallahu ta'ala an ghayrihi. That's what it is, and that's what you have. Well, that's the sound one. The other sound one, he tells you, I don't think so. Khalas, done. Quran Sunnah makes no difference. Now, Subhanallah, the Asra is a ta'zim. Ta'zim. That you first, Allah Ta'ala started the ayah with ta'zim, so you glorify Allah because wama qadarullah haqqa qadri. They don't understand, they don't appreciate Allah Ta'ala the way Allah Ta'ala is worthy of being appreciated, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. And that's why you say, Allah said, Subhanallah, the Asra. Even if you try to imagine, you can't imagine, it's beyond you at all points. Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi. Then Allah says, bi abdihi. Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi laylan. Ajib, he did not say, Subhanallah, asra bi rasulihi. Subhanallah, asra bi nabiyihi. Subhanallah, asra bi habibihi. Bi safiyihi. Bi khalilihi. All these things are there. Haqiqa or not haqiqa? Haqiqa and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah, Habibullah, Nabiullah, all these titles that we like. Utaban, we refuse to actually answer to people if they don't address us with the correct title. To try to tell somebody, especially those people who are title keen or title centered. Yani his name is before his name, you have to call him doctor or sheikh or maulana or try to call him by his name. Shish kebab. <laughs> notice Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq what did the Sahaba call him? Abu Bakr Abu Bakr Wa Amr they called him Amr as well he didn't get offended Wa Uthman they called him Uthman Wa Ali they called him Ali you went to your values by the titles you put before and after in the middle of your names that's not the title of the human beings today this is also centered in the thinking of people meaning what yani your value is what your title is not your contribution I don't mean by contribution money as well obviously money as well but not contribution your contribution to society your contribution to humanity your contribution to your ummah your contribution to your deen your contribution to yourself and your family akhi. That contribution that you do, a difference that you make other than the life of a chicken or a bird who lives and works hard and builds a nest and feeds the children. Other than that, what did you contribute? Well, that's the whole point. The contribution is the point. Like, and that's the values that are put now, not only on Muslim males, on Muslim women as well. Yani today the value of a Muslim woman oftentimes is put throughout all these commercials. I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about Muslim majority countries. The value is how much she reveals, how much access, visual access she gives other people to her, to her body. That's the value. MashaAllah, that means you are very modern and very liber liberated. You're liberated from what? In mind, I'm not saying anything. All I'm saying that these are not to be really standards or titles of people, whether they I've studied seven, eight million years in this in this uh, seminary or in this school or in this university. Show me the contribution. Don't tell me how much you studied. Who well, everybody studies? Well, the whole life is this university. What's the contribution? Tangible contribution. And that's why uh, amongst the most important ma'ajiz or mu'jiza of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam was what until you think? Yeah, you think he was, his mu'jiza was uh, on, like Allah ta'ala obviously gave him the Quran, gave him many mu'jizas. Amongst the biggest mu'jizas after the book of Allah, what is it you think? Being able to transform that human being who lived off of violence, killing, hate, slavery, to who? To a human being who believes in exchange of opinions 
freedom, believes in the worth and the dignity of a human being, believe that if you cannot do injustice because if you do, even if it's a word, you're going to be held, like, held accountable in the day of judgment for it. You have to pay for it dearly. For someone who used to use the sword as a means of living to someone who weeps when he sees a dog thirsty or a cat being tortured. And that, that's the transformation. That's the difficult thing. How can you change the human being to a con God conscientious person that does muraqaba of Allah? That's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hadith Sahih where he says, What is Ihsan Hadith Jibreel? He says, That you worship him as if you're seeing him. That's the whole point. That you worship him Ta'ala as if you're seeing him. You're not just worshiping him, but worshiping him as if you're seeing him. That transmission or that transition was was the was was the miracle well that's very easy to, to take people from who someone who rides a camel to give him a car here now you're riding a camel or a donkey bismillah let me teach you how to drive a car here are the keys oh he loves this uh, this advancement he, oh, no problem has a problem with that you take somebody who lives in a tent you give him a big palace and everything and all this he says live in no problem that's not a transition the transition, the transition of the akhlaq and the mind and the heart and the soul, that's the transition. Well, the people act, that makes no difference. Now, that's why Allah says, Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi. Why abdihi? Abdihi in the Arabic language could have two meanings. Number one, abd comes from being owned. That's why erroneously people call abd slave. Because they thought that people, slave owners owned slaves. They really didn't own slaves. Nobody owns your soul. Allah Ta'ala created your soul free. Nobody can own your soul. Your soul is only enslaved, meaning in the matter, created and owned and the property and the dominion of Allah. Rabbul Alameen. Well, but people, what they did is like they did Umayyah bin Khalaf did to Bilal, radiyallahu anhu. He brought Bilal because he thought that he owned Bilal. He kidnapped him and sold him and bought him and all these things. And he tortured him. So that Abd means slave, meaning for the slave owner, allegedly. Well, you don't really own because ownership means that you actually have. You don't even own yourself to own others. If you own yourself, please take your, your money with your checkbook with you to the grave. Please. <laughs> But okay, don't take your checkbook. Take your sight with you to the grave. Take your hearing with you to the grave. Take your children with you to the grave. You are not going. You are helpless, miskin. خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفَ. You are a weak human being, as Allah Taala created, said. Weak. خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ. The insan is ضعيف, is weak. لكن obviously, for to some people who who believe that might makes right, we don't think that this was an old concept. لا لا. The concept continues on. Might makes right. And that's why they enslaved others in the sense. And then that slave owner to them meant the willingness to torture them if they don't obey. Well, that's, that's all it is. But they don't own anything in them. al ubudiyah means being owned. And ownership, true ownership is only to Allah. Nobody has ownership other than Allah. Al-mulk lillah. Liman al-mulk al to whom belong the mulk, the kingdom, the ownership? Lillahi al-wahid al-qahar. Only to Allah al-wahid. Nobody has kingdom or, or rules or owns anything. It's all something that Allah gives you. Whatever you do with it, after your time, your lease is up. Once the lease is up, you have to return the check in the property where it belongs. Huh? Oh, it's a lease. Well, not only that, there's damage uh, calculations. Did you do bad to the, to the property when you had it with you? Okay, now you have to pay. Why do you do that when you rent a car? Obviously, to Allah belongs the highest of examples. Number one, بِعَبْدِهِ الْعَبُودِيَ means to be what? To be owned by someone. And as, طبعاً, this is granted because everyone is, every, all the creation is owned by Allah. All the creation is created by Allah. So this meaning of عَبُودِيَ is given anyway. Like, and maybe there's another meaning of ubudiyah that Allah Ta'ala also wanted to tell us. A worshipper from ibadah. A worshipper of Allah. Someone who voluntarily worship and submits to Allah. 
that Taslim or that Islam, oftentimes we think Islam is a noun versus Islam is actually a verb continuously going. Huh? Meaning, what do you mean by a verb, Islam? Islam means submission. Continuous verb means what? I submit today that which I did not submit yesterday. And I'll submit to Allah Ta'ala more and I'll submit to Allah Ta'ala more until you are in total submission to Allah. There is nothing in you but you are acting that which Allah Ta'ala instructed you or commanded you to do. That's when you are in total submission. That's why to that verb meaning Allah Ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah when Allah Ta'ala said about Ibrahim, إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah told Ibrahim, Aslim, submit to Allah. Now Aslam doesn't mean say, أَشَهَدُوا أَلَّا إِلَا إِلَّا 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 Ibrahim كَانَ مِنَ الْمُوْقِنِينَ لكن أسلم now in the meaning of verb become sub in total submission to Allah. قَالَ أَسْلَمْتْ I have submitted entirely لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And that's how people today, they live in this sort of uh, agony. They don't want to submit to Allah. They think they have a short plan, sh short way. Short way, until you design the universe. Short way, what short way? No, until you say in your salah, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ is the closest way between two points based on our linear understanding. Huh? And in the meaning here, obviously, so you don't take me to the M theory again. Lacking in the meaning that it is the straight and the clear path. إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ People still, they want to sort of battle with the instructions. They want to battle with the way that Allah Ta'ala told them, this is the way. They want to battle. They think they have a better way. They, obviously, they don't have a better way. They'll spend their whole life and they'll regret if they have time to regret, if they're fortunate enough to have time to reflect, correct, and regret. We don't want, may Allah Ta'ala not make us among those who are regretful. To reflect, ya akhi, that's the whole point. Afala yatadhakkaroon, la yaqiloon, la, all these things. Subhana alladhi asra bi abdihi bi ubudiyya. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a true abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense of ubudiyya of Allah. It means we all are ibad of Allah, but do you feel, do you experience that you are owned by Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you belong to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. You and what you have and what you say and what you do all belong to Allah. That you are not alone, you are not in the Dependent, you are his property, subhanahu wa ta'ala, at his command, subhanahu wa ta'ala, under his sovereignty, Jalla Jalalu. That's the whole point. It's living with the meaning of Ubudiyya, and that's when Allah Ta'ala says, Alayhi Allahu bi kafin abda, isn't Allah enough for his slave? Without a doubt. Haq bala. Bala. Indeed, Allah is enough. How come then we say we are ibad of Allah, but when Allah is not enough for us, we go to this one and we go to that one and we think, huh, we seek them instead of Allah. Because There's that shirk khafi that's still in there, though the ayah is not there, like the ayah has an ishara, that there's that shirk khafi, there's that I pray so others see, I do it for social utility, I do it for feeling better, I don't do sins because it's good for my health. Where is that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where is that relationship with Allah that intrinsically wants to make you a better human being? And that's what a good Muslim is. A good Muslim is a good human being in the first place.